From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, a show where I investigate the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Last year, Abby Wambach gave a commencement speech at Barnard College, and it went viral. Like all little girls, I was taught to be grateful. I was taught to keep my head down, stay on the path, and get my job done. I was freaking Little Red Riding Hood. You know that fairy tale. Little Red goes off through the forest. She doesn't heed the warning not to stray, and she crosses paths with a wolf. Like Little Red, Abby didn't heed the warning. And that, that made all the difference for her. In her career as a soccer player, she's won two Olympic gold medals. She has scored more goals than anyone else, male or female, anywhere in the world. She captained the 2015 USA women's team that won the World Cup, and four years after she retired from the sport, she's building a leadership coaching business. And she had this to say. If I could go back and tell my younger self one thing, it would be this. Abby, you were never Little Red Riding Hood. You were always the wolf. This message struck a chord for the graduates and for the hundreds of thousands who watched the clips of the speech online. And it makes sense. Think about it. We all came up in a culture that has been largely defined by men, and we've learned to succeed according to rules they wrote. It's been a year and a half since the beginning of the Me Too movement, and there's a growing sense that those rules that governed our workplace and our culture, they don't hold up anymore. Women have been emboldened and empowered. We are as Abby says, the wolves. But here's the thing. The new rules for how we all behave in the workplace are just emerging. We're feeling them out together, men and women. Abby's speech and her subsequent book, it's called Wolf Pack. It spells out what she has learned about teamwork, failure, confidence, and how to be a leader in this entirely new age. Here's Abby. Hello Monday is a podcast for business professionals. So business professionals as men and women. And as we... Yes, I know what you're going to do right now. And this is my favorite part of the entire book. (laughs) Sincerely. It really is. I'm glad that you're pointing it out because it's one of the things I'm most proud of of that book because I think that it's such a departure. So go ahead. Sorry. Well, we have to start with this. And that is the note to your reader. And I'm going to just read a couple of paragraphs from it. So recently on a call with a company hiring me to teach about leadership, a man said, excuse me, Abby. I just need to ensure that what you present is applicable to men, too. And I said, good question, but only if you've asked it of every male speaker you've hired if his message is applicable to women, too. Women have had to find themselves within content presented from the male perspective forever. It's essential to flip this and allow men the opportunity to find themselves within content presented from a women's perspective. So, Abby, do you get that question a lot? Well... Truthfully, I don't get that question a lot. I get the implication a lot. You know, not to like blow this guy up because who knows, he'll probably never read this book. I have no idea. And I think it was such an important part of this book because think about how many books out there or how many pieces of art or the things that are created are created by men and for men. And women have been reading these things and and consuming whatever the products and the the stuff that gets sent out in the world. I think it's just high time, right, for for guys to to know what women have been feeling. And this is an invitation, too. You know, this isn't only for women like men. Hey, I hate men. Like, no, like that's actually the opposite. I hope that all men everywhere feel like this book is an invitation to learning more about what women go through. I have worked in organizations that are full of men and women working together. I have run up against all of the, you know, frustrating doors that you read about. And a couple of years ago, it was like all at once the rules changed. The old rules, they just stopped applying. But nobody told us what the new rules were yet. Mm-hmm. And so I want to I want to know really like how you figured those rules out. Yeah. When you get to like uncover and try to figure out what you know, you have to figure out why you know it. And the creation of that has made me understand more about why I know what I know. And living in and among and around other badass women on the national team gave me an opportunity that maybe not many other women get. Very rarely do we find ourselves in all women environments. And for me, I was super privileged enough to be able to be around 
other really high functioning, successful, badass women who all thought that they were the best in the world. Rightfully so. Right. We're on the women's national team. And because of that experience, we didn't really adhere to all these old rules that I talk about in the book. We didn't adhere to like some of these rules that now being detached and separated from the national team and into my retirement, I see out in the world that women don't know some of the stuff that I know and some of the stuff that I learned by being on the national team for so long. So this is my attempt to bring people to a higher level of who they want to be in their lives. And women don't understand or also don't have access to the knowledge of why am I doing this stuff? Right. And not only that, what is the solution? What is the alternative, right? Okay. So your version of the old rule is you're on your own here. And your version of the new rule is, well, you're not alone. You've got your pack. Yeah. How did you get there? One of the things I realized very quickly when I retired is that traveling the world with your friends and playing a sport for a job, it it feels like a fairy tale a lot of the time, right? That doesn't mean it doesn't come with sacrifices or hardships, right? Being fit, staying super, super lean and always kind of being on some sort of diet, pushing your body to the limit to try to continually get better every single day. And then the drive personally to build, and I hate this word, but to build a brand for myself that would be able to outlast my career. Why do you hate that word? Because I think that it feels super narcissistic as an individual athlete. And I think that now in my retirement, uh, I'm building a business. So building my business beyond sport has kind of been my focus. But when you are around so many amazing women and people for so many years, and then all of a sudden now I'm traveling the country and the world alone, I'm having to figure out this whole working out on my own thing and maintaining some sense of accountability and learning how to create a schedule and making decisions about what I want to do, who I want to be, what I enjoy, what I'm good at. Like I had to do a huge identity, a a recreation of, of who I thought I was because I wrapped so much of myself up in Abby Wambach, the soccer player. And now that soccer's gone, who am I going to be? Because when you're inside the kind of ecosystem that I was inside of it, you know, it's almost like too good to be true. And stepping on the outside of it, it's super lonely. And the transition of it was really lonely and really hard. And I think that, you know, I actually was on a run one day and I came back and Glennon was inside and I... And Glennon is your wife. Yes. Yeah. Glennon Doyle. She's amazing. And I just was F-bombing. I was like, I don't know why it's so effing hard. (laughs) Like back when I was playing, it wasn't, it didn't feel as hard. And I don't know why it takes so much energy for me to like get the courage to put my running shoes on. And then it feels like it's just a million times harder than working out ever was. And she just said it so simply. She's like, oh, well, you don't have other people around you. And that's it. The truth is, is when the world is so hard and living life is is so complicated that doing it alone is impossible. But when you have people around you, your wolf pack, even though you're doing the same thing, it feels like it's not as much of a suffering event as possible. The reason why I was so successful on the field is because I had people that, I, that were challenging me and that we were competing with each other, not against. And it made me think about the ways that women treat each other in workplaces, in more traditional workplaces, like offices that I've worked in. And women haven't always been nice to each other. They've had to compete with each other in frameworks where they didn't necessarily set the rules. Yeah, of course. You know, the the scarcity mentality runs so rampant through women's psyche, right? Because most places of work, there's there's usually only one and, and maybe two seats at the quote unquote table. Or there's, there's only so much money in the pie to get sliced, right? And, and more for her means less for me. Like That is the belief system that women truly have embodied because that is the way that the world has kind of been running. But the truth is, is that there are more women trying to get into leadership positions. And why do you think men support each other across businesses or across industries? Because they know eventually it will eventually come back to them, right? 
women in the world have to figure out that women are not to be feared. Other women in our business are not to be feared. And you have to actually create the environments for other women to see what women want is good. That is why it's so important that more women get into the Oval Office, that more women keep working their, their tails off to get to, to become CEOs and to, to become high-level managers who are making big decisions for the big company, right? Because what women want is good. Yeah, but explain that. When a woman is given something, let's say a farmer in a third world country, a woman is given a micro loan. What she does with that micro loan actually serves the entire community. The trickle down effect of what happens when women are given stuff, are privileged with whether it be resources or goats or or a privileged job, whatever it is, right. they oftentimes are trying to create more systemic ways and programs inside to try to help the other people around them. And that's just because of how we're built. But in order to get there, women actually have to feel worthy. And in order to feel worthy, you have to have other women around you, other people that know what you've gone through so that you can figure out how to actually work together. This, the opposite of patriarchy is not matriarchy. That is not the goal or the mission here. Women have to find the kind of courage and the inspiration. And sometimes it's really hard not only to do it alone, but it's hard to do it because so many women in the world feel siloed, especially in the business world, right? And I think that in order to actually make that jump, because the, all the statistics show that women getting promoted into higher positions, that's stalled, right? So what are the problems? How do we solve for X? And I think that getting women to believe that the space that they are in, they are worthy of. Because, you know, we have we have this this imposter syndrome that just is real. It's a real thing, it's true. you know, and I think that when women uh, let's say a woman is in a business meeting and she's the only woman in the room. And if you have a lot of male listeners, if there's a woman in a business meeting, and she's the only woman in the room. Just for one second, think about what it feels like to be that woman. You know, and, and if you can do that, you will have this kind of empathy and you will try to bring her into the fold rather than thinking, oh, because we have this unconscious bias about who women are. And, you know, she's not going to she's not going to work as much as me because she's got to go home to the family. And all of the things that point in the direction of more equality in the right. business world starts with giving women more power and more resources, because like I said, what women want is good. Coming up after the break, we introduce our own practical playbook for helping women at work. Today's show is brought to you by Zebit. Having zero of anything isn't always something to celebrate, unless we're talking Zebit. Zebit believes it can change your whole perspective on zero forever. Zebit is an e-commerce site that lets you buy now and pay over time without paying interest, whether you're looking for a watch, an espresso machine, or a new TV. There's zero cost to join, no membership fees or late fees, there's zero impact on your credit score because Zebit doesn't check your credit. And of course, there's zero interest. That's the point. Zebit has more than 50,000 products in their marketplace with brand names like Xbox, Sony, Apple, GoPro, and Fitbit. From electronics to barbecues, furniture, and more, Zebit has everything you need for when you need it. Sign up for Zebit today at zebit.com slash hello monday and get $2,500 credit to shop the Zebit marketplace at zero interest and zero cost to join. That's Z-E-B-I-T dot com slash Hello Monday for $2,500 of interest-free credit. Zebit dot com slash Hello Monday. Today's show is brought to you by Sunbasket. No matter your lifestyle, Sunbasket caters to your kind of healthy. And that makes a huge difference for someone like me. I get home from a long day of work and I've got half an hour maybe to get the baby in bed and between my wife and I to figure out who's going to make supper. With a delicious meal plan like paleo, carb-conscious, gluten-free, Mediterranean, diabetes-friendly, and vegan, plus quick and easy recipes, I can enjoy a dinner full of organic produce and clean ingredients in as little as 15 minutes. Try mouthwatering sun basket dishes like healthy shrimp pad thai with rice noodles and sugar snap peas, or fresh fettuccine primavera with creamy feta sauce. Those are just a couple of 18 weekly recipes to choose from. Everything is pre-measured and easy to prep. You can get a healthy and delicious meal on the table in as little as 15 minutes. So go to sunbasket.com slash hello monday to get $80 off. 
That's basically getting dinner on the table for less than $9 a serving for your first four weeks. Visit sunbasket.com slash hello monday to get $80 off today. Okay, I'm back with more of this week's episode. A lot of Abby's messages here are pretty high level. She wants women everywhere to treat each other like the women she played soccer with. But how do you do that? This week, our reporter Caroline Fairchild offers us a playbook. Things that you can do this week, today, whatever your gender, to make your workplace work better for female colleagues. Hey, Caroline. Hey, Jesse. So this week, I wanted to talk to female CEOs, female leaders, and researchers about what they can actually do practically to support women in the workplace. And one of the first things that I found is that it's really important to not only promote, but also echo ideas from women in meetings, over email, and more. This is something I'm sure you've heard as well. All the time. And in fact, I have been in situations where people have done that to me. And it's so empowering because you're sitting at a table, you say something, and then five minutes later, the guy across the table says it. And by the way, these are really great folks acting on unconscious bias that they're not always aware of. And then that third colleague, male or female, and it's happened with both men and women in my life, says, oh, yeah, you know what Bob said is interesting. It sounds exactly like Jesse. And the reason that that's important is because the research shows us that unlike men, women are penalized for self-promotion. So if you were to say, hey, that was my idea, unfortunately, that's going to look poorly on you and your colleagues. So if you just have that one person in the room, is it a man? Is it a woman? It doesn't matter. Who can just echo the fact that you had that point first? It can really help women go a long way. What else can men and women do to help female colleagues find their voice? This next one sounds small, but it's actually really important in terms of both men and women developing relationships with each other in the workplace. Because if you think about it, relationships really are your social currency. So what you can do is share more about yourself at work, not just about what you're working on with your colleagues, but things about you that make you who you are. And that's something that I think throughout time, most men, not all men, but a lot of men haven't really thought twice about because work is sort of tailored socially to men's interests. And yet a lot of the conversations that women have, you might not feel comfortable bringing some of them up, talking to some of them with their colleagues. Right. I think the classic example is a group of women talking about fashion or retail or something that may be historically thought of as a feminine conversation a man walking into the conversation and all the women apologizing. That typically doesn't happen the other way around. If you walk into a conversation about sports that's being had by a lot of men, they don't tend to apologize if women come to the table. So there's a lesson here for men, and there's also a lesson here for women. What else? Okay, so this is very practical, and this is something that hiring managers have more say in than non-hiring managers, but... Demand women get interviews and track their progress when they get into the door. So we've heard about this. The NFL created this rule a few years ago called the Rooney Rule, which just made sure that there was a diverse candidate on every single slate for an open job. We're now seeing companies across industries also developing Rooney Rules where they're making sure that for each open position, at least one diverse candidate is being considered. This is just important because if women aren't coming to the jobs that are in the workplace, the workplace itself is not going to be as inclusive as it could be, which is, as we heard from Abby, makes it hard for women to find their teams. Right. And it's not enough to just have some sort of a quota rule to say, well, you have to consider at least one candidate who is from a non-traditional background before you choose your person. I see that happening a lot. It's just window dressing where a person is brought in for a job and no one ever expects that they're going to be the hire. Just somebody somewhere can check a box. And really the distinction that we're talking about now is the difference between recruitment and retention. If you're checking the box, if you're getting the female candidate in, if she's getting one out of 10 jobs, but then she gets to the office and it's not an inclusive place to work, nothing's going to change. So this is really not just about checking the box, but ensuring that your workforce really does understand that diverse teams do perform better. Is there anything else that we can keep in mind? Yes, there's one more thing. So this is my favorite because it mostly revolves around men and what they can do. And this is that if there are policies that are supporting women at your workplace, make sure that men are taking advantage of them as well. We see a lot of corporate America stepping up to the plate, not as much as maybe we would like when it comes to things like paternity policy or other policies that allow workers who need a break to spend time with their families to do that. But if it's only the women who are taking advantage of these policies, it's sending a signal to the larger workplace that this is something that isn't actually OK. It's not until we see leaders across genders taking advantage and fully using these benefits that they really are going to benefit everyone. That's a really great point. And here, Caroline, as we wrap up, it's probably important to remind our listeners, 
Y'all have heard this before. We are not telling you things that you haven't heard before. You've also heard to eat less sugar. You've also heard to exercise. These things are practices. They're like muscles you have to strengthen. They're definitely like muscles to strengthen. And you heard me say that these are small things. And I think that may be why people don't do them. They think that they're small, but their impact is so large. So even if you think that it's something small, doing it tomorrow in the workplace could make a huge difference for your colleagues. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up after the break, Abby tells us what she learned when she stopped playing professional soccer. Today's show is brought to you by Fundrise. Real estate investing is known for a lot of things, mainly making a select group of people a lot of money. But being an online cutting-edge experience is usually not one of its hallmarks. Well, that is no longer the case. It offers software that cuts out costly middlemen and old market inefficiencies and delivers the kind of investing power you usually only see at giant institutions, bringing real estate's unique potential for long-term growth and cash flow to individual investors. People. Getting started is simple. When you invest, you will be instantly diversified across dozens of real estate projects, each one carefully vetted and actively managed by Fundrise's team of real estate pros. Then you can use their intuitive investor dashboard and real-time reporting system to monitor the progress of each property within your portfolio. So visit fundrise.com slash hello monday. That's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash hello monday to have your first three months of fees waived. Now back to Abby. So I want to talk about your personal career trajectory. One of the most beautiful things about watching you play was watching you own the fact that you were really good at yeah. what you wanted to do. Yeah. And then you retired. I want to know what the last bit of your career felt like as your own ability shifted and what it felt like to figure out how to be whatever you came to next. Yeah. You know, I was a pretty confident kid and a confident teen and a confident young adult. But I hadn't really figured out how to unleash my full power until I found myself on a, on a practice field with Michelle Akers. And she's at the time she was 30. I was like 18 years old or something. And I had never seen somebody embody their power quite like she did. She was just such a badass and just like moved the way she moved, the way she commanded attention and not for attention's sake, but like because she owned her strengths and she owned the responsibility of the success of the team. She demanded the ball. And there's two parts to demanding the ball, right? If you are out in the world just saying, give me the ball, I want the promotion, I want this, like the deal that you are making by saying those things out loud and and putting yourself in that position of power is that you have to have follow through, right? So you can't just <laughs> run around being like, give me this, give me that, give me this. You actually have to follow through with whatever it is. If you say, give me the ball, you damn well better score, right? You damn well better know that this moment is a big moment and you got to take the complete responsibility on your shoulders. So as my career progressed, what was interesting is like all um, aging athletes, your body slows down a little bit, but you get smarter in your head. You get smarter in your decision making. Things come a little bit quicker to you than a younger player. You're making fewer mistakes, but you're able to cover less ground. So it's kind of this weird, this weird psychological mind f, if you know what I mean, because your body slows down, but your your brain speeds up, and so it's about figuring out how to process through that period of your your career. And as I got older, especially in the last year of my career, you know, my role on the team as it related to the game was changing, but. I didn't want that to be the thing that defined me, right? So I really put a ton of attention and time in what I felt was my leadership skill. I put a ton of time into cultivating relationships with the players on the team, cultivating a relationship with my coach, and doing everything possible that I could aside from the game, outside of the lines, right? Text messaging teammates, making sure that everybody was flying and confident as they possibly could be going in the, the 2015 World Cup. And, you know, I think that the experience of playing on the national team and then kind of getting benched at the end of the 2015 World Cup, those were the kind of leadership lessons that I had yet to learn. Because, and I talk about it in the book, like if you're not a leader on the bench, then you can't call yourself a leader on the field. 
no matter what, my goal was to just help the team win. And that goal was still more important than my own ego and my own desire to play and my own desire to score the goals or whatever. And I think that 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 for me, in terms of the evolution of my career, I wouldn't be writing this book had I responded differently on the sidelines. Right. Uh, Because I had a choice, you know, I had a choice to either be a positive force for our team in the, the in those knockout round games in the World Cup in 2015, or I could have been on the bench and pouted, and that wouldn't have helped us. We wouldn't have end up, ended up winning. It strikes me as, as I'm listening to you talk that in some ways, this huge gift that you have, the gift of being so skilled at soccer, is in its own way a limitation in that the better you are at one thing, the scarier it is to be bad at other things. Yeah, totally. Terrifying is probably a better word. But I think that the muscle that I was able to develop on the national team really helped me in managing those experiences when I retired. You know, being in the national team, people don't know this, but one of the most important things is everybody has their own specific strength, right? Most of the women on the field are basically the best maybe in the world at what they do well, right? And the other things, you know, whether you call them understrengths or weaknesses, those are things that we talk about openly on the national team. Like, oh, you know, I'm not the quickest player, you know, in the world. And that's when Alex Morgan is like, you don't need to be quick. You need to be a target forward and you need to be strong. So, like, you focus your energies on your strengths and I will be the quick player, right? I will pick up where where maybe some of your weaknesses lie, right? And so all over the field, you have these kind of beautiful dynamics going on. And I think that that's super important. And something I'm trying to teach these women in the program that I'm running is that you don't have to be good at everything. You just don't. What you need to know is what you're good at and try to figure out and focus your business inside of that triangle. So when you're building a team, you want to build in both strengths and weaknesses so that when they all connect, you're actually a solid unified unit, you know? Totally. But I want to know what your internal life was like through, in particular, the end of your career and the transition. Did you like yourself? That's a good question. Well, I had just recently gotten sober. So I was like super happy with what I was able to do in terms of getting sober. Um, when did you get sober? I got sober right at the end. So I actually got a DUI right after I retired. My, my life was in shambles. I mean, and I was just really struggling with this whole idea of different life other than soccer player. And then that came out in all the different ways, whether it be just abusing alcohol. And I got the DUI and that was a really beautiful, hard moment, no doubt. Worst thing that ever happened in my life. But turned it into the most beautiful and positive thing that ever happened because it really woke me up to the facts of what I was really struggling and suffering with uh, at the time. Was it hard to do that under the spotlight? Yeah, of course. You know, like when you when when you have a sense of fame and you have a sense of honor, like what people might not know about me is that even though I was really suffering with alcoholism, I have such a strong sense of honor that once this thing, this like dark secret sort of sort of thing was exposed and I was like on the ticker on ESPN, I've got the DUI, my mug shots everywhere. That was a pretty big wake up call. Uh, And my life completely changed because I started choosing to live rather than choosing to slowly die. Next week on the show. Stanford professor Fei-Fei Li is among the small group of people responsible for catapulting AI from research labs to industry. A decade ago, she taught computers how to read images. Now she focuses on creating AI that's good for people. We want to be here participating and making sure it is a benevolent force and making a positive change. If you enjoyed listening, subscribe and rate us on iTunes. It helps new listeners find the show. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show was produced by Laura Sim and Fernando Gallegos, with reporting by Caroline Fairchild. The show was mixed by Joe DeDorgi. Florencia Ariando is head of editorial video. Dave Pond is our technical director. A special thanks this week to listener Alex Ahorn, who sent us a voice memo ahead of Abby's interview. I'm a huge football fan, or you call it soccer over there, and she's definitely one of the greatest people in the sport's history on and off the pitch. 
Our music was by Poddington Bear and Pachyderm. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Thanks for listening. You must be super great at coaching your daughter's soccer team now. (laughs) I don't know if I'm great. I don't actually coach them anymore. And it's just fun. You know, it's fun watching these kids grow up and learn the game and uh, sitting on the sidelines and dealing with parents. By the way, parents are the worst. (laughs) Um, You'll learn with with your young one as, as Jude grows up. But sincerely, sitting on the sidelines, it's embarrassing how fired up parents get, not only at the referee. Let's be real, folks. Like, the referee has no cherished outcome of this game. Like, they're coaching, they're refereeing 10-year-olds or 13-year-olds or whatever. They don't care about what happens. And people don't understand. Sports is about creativity and growing and figuring stuff out your, on your own. And your kid is going to suck because guess what? All children suck at sports. <laughs> they just do. I sucked at sports, <laughs> you know? And basically, the most important thing to remember, parents, is that your kid is probably not going to make the pros. Just, um, they're not. I'm sorry well, to tell you. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. You haven't met Jude. <laughs>